Hey guys, I hope this video meets you having a wonderful 2014. Happy New Year to all of you. Can't wait to see you guys on Monday. Um, I tried to delay this video as long as possible so that you'd have most of your break to hopefully relax and get my um, nervous system. Was it the nervous system? Whatever project it was that I gave you. I, I digress. Anyway, here we go. Lim immune system. All right, so your body needs a defense. And the reason you need a defense is because, let's be realistic, you, you make a very appetizing meal to lots of different things. Animals, viruses, um, bacteria, fungi, protists, pretty much anything would love to get a chance to eat us. And it's because we're full of those macromolecules that everyone uses as a food supply. Those carbohydrates and proteins and lipids especially. Um, we're tons and tons of cells big. I mean, every living organism, especially if you're a vertebrate, is made up of billions and billions of eukaryotic cells. So it's almost like a never-ending supply of food, depending on how big or how small the thing attacking you is. We've made it really easy to be a target. We've, we have no cell wall that's going to add any kind of extra layer of protection. Um, some animals have found ways to defend themselves and others rely on an internal defense mechanism and we're one of those animals. We don't have sharp claws or really hard, tough exoskeleton or, you know, really hard integumentary system or anything like that. All of our defense, for the most part, our major defense comes from inside. If that weren't bad enough, we also have parts and pieces on our insides that may potentially decide to attack us in the form of cancers. So, yeah, we're, we're just kind of in for it. So, we could sit down and list names and names and names of things that would cause us harm. But instead of doing that, we give them a generalistic name called a pathogen. So a pathogen is any agent, anything that will cause a disease that can infect um, a wide range of animals, including humans. So that would be your viruses, your bacteria, your fungi, your protists, cancer cells, anything that's going to cause you some kind of illness or harm is considered a pathogen. Our immune system is built on its ability, or it's based on the ability to recognize foreign particles, foreign bodies, things that were not made by our own body. And when that happens, it generates a response. And that response is going to consist of a bunch of immune cells and some different types of proteins. That being said, we have two types of immunity. We have innate immunity, which animals really are the only ones that have that, and we have adaptive immunity. All animals have innate immunity. It's the immunity, it's the defense that we pretty much were born with. It's what comes into play right away upon the onset of an infection. Whereas adaptive immunity is something that we develop over time. All right, so like I was saying, your innate immunity is present before you're even fully formed. It's one of the things that your mom kind of passes on to you. And it's effective from your time of birth. So from the time you come into the world, you have some form of an innate immunity already. It is a nonspecific response. So what that means is it, it acts the same way regardless of what the pathogen is or what the, the um, disease-causing agent might be. And what does it consist of? Mostly an external barrier plus some internal cellular and chemical defenses. We'll, we'll delve deeper into this in a little bit. Adaptive immunity, on the other hand, is what you have acquired over the span of your life. It's developed after you've been exposed to certain things like microbes and toxins and any other foreign substances. So to be honest, when you were little and you played in the dirt and you ate the dirt, that really wasn't that terrible of a thing because it helped to build your adaptive immunity. It's those kids who've been sheltered their whole lives, never been allowed to go outside or pick up anything or constantly washing their hands, never been in contact with other people that don't really develop a very strong adaptive immunity. So that's why when they go to daycare for the very first time, and now they're exposed by hundreds and hundreds of germs, they get sick. 
Now, the diff one of the main differences between your innate immunity and your adaptive immunity is your adaptive immunity is a specific response. So it doesn't respond the same way to every pathogen. That response is going to change depending on what it is that's making you ill. All right. This is just a diagram that kind of breaks down innate immunity and adaptive immunity and shows you where they're found and what some of the major parts and pieces are. I'm about to step into that in detail in the next couple of slides. All right, so here's just a little diagram to kind of show what we were talking about where it comes to innate versus adaptive. So let's start with innate. All animals have innate. It doesn't matter if you're a vertebrate or an invertebrate, you're going to have some kind of innate immunity. It's a very quick response, and it's based on the recognition of a broad range of traits that all pathogens are going to naturally present. So we can break it down into external defenses or barrier defenses and internal defenses. Barrier defenses will be things like our skin which actually makes up a pretty good barrier system because it's fairly complete. Then things like our mucosis membranes and the secretions that our body produces. So those little hairs on the inside of your nose and your eyelashes are all a form of defense. The tears that you produce are a form of defense. The mucus that drains from your nose, which is kind of gross, that's also a form of defense. But all of these things are external. They're trying to prevent the pathogen from even getting inside of you. Internal defenses is what's going to kick in once something has breached those external defenses. So your internal defenses are going to be things like phagocytic cells and natural killer cells and special antimicrobial proteins and your body's ability to go through what we call the inflammatory response. So like swelling and fevers and things like that. <clears throat> Adaptive immunity is only found in vertebrates, so only if you have a backbone do you have adaptive immunity. It, all, it too depends on a recognition of a bunch of traits that similar pathogens are going to share, but there are a bunch of different receptors that can interpret those traits. It's a much slower response. It's broken down into two sections as well, the humoral response and cell-mediated response. Humoral response is what happens when your body triggers antibodies to defend against infections. This happens in body fluids, so like in blood or in lymph, for example. Cell-mediated response. So starting with innate immunity, like I said, it's nonspecific. It is recognition and response, but it's based on traits that are common to a bunch of pathogens. Okay, so it, it's a broad-based response. In general, the way it works is uh, these groups of organisms or these types of pathogens may have these certain characteristics. So if I do this, it'll shut all of them down. That's kind of how it functions. So what your immune system does is it recognizes bacteria and fungi based on structures on their cell walls. But it doesn't go so far as to recognize what kind of bacteria and then specialize its attack for that particular type of bacteria. So it doesn't care if it's Streptococcus pneumoniae, it doesn't care if it's Streptococcus aureus, it doesn't care what kind of bacteria it is, it just knows it's bacteria, boom, we're gonna use the same kind of response for all of them. Now, it is going to, res to vary based on the class of pathogen. So, for example, it's not going to do the same thing to bacteria as it would do to fungi because it can tell the difference between the two. It's found in all animals and plants. Yes, even plants have their own version of innate immunity. We'll talk about that when we talk about plant development. Um, and in vertebrates, innate immunity is your very first response that you have to any kind of infections, and it also su um, serves sorry, as the basis on which your adaptive immunity is going to be built. So feel free to pause here if you need to, and write down what you need. I'm moving on. Okay, so in invertebrates, innate immunity is a little bit different. Insects, for example, one of their main lines of defense is their exoskeleton, which is made up of that polymer, that macromolecule, called chitin. So that's going to be their very first barrier to pathogens. Something can't make you sick unless it can get inside of you. That's the basis on which they work. Now, if you do get inside, now what? Well, most insects 
have a chitin, sorry, have a lysozyme, which is an enzyme that has the ability to break down bacterial cell walls. So if you get through the exoskeleton, then the next line of defense is going to be that specialized type of enzyme. Excuse me. Then they also have hemocytes. Hemocytes are going to circulate within their hemolymph. Now let me pause here for a second. We have blood, and insects have blood, but we don't call it blood. We call it hemolymph. Just, just deal. Um, so <laughs> hemocytes are going to circulate within their hemolymph, and they carry out phagocytosis. So hemocytes are kind of like an insect's version of some of our types of white blood cells. Another thing that insects can do is they can secrete antimicrobial peptides, so antimicrobial proteins, in other words, that will disrupt or burst or lyse the plasma membrane of fungi and bacteria. Again, pause if you need to. Now, when, let's look at an innate immunity in invertebrates. Insects, which would be a good example of an invertebrate, don't really have the same body type and body features that vertebrates have. One of the main differences is the fact that they have an exoskeleton, their skeletons on the outside, whereas our skeletons on the inside. That exoskeleton is made up of chitin, and it's going to be their first barrier, or their first line of defense when it comes to pathogens. Chitin's a very, very structurally hard and tensely strong. All right. So this slide just goes through phagocytosis and shows you how the pseudopodia forms around the pathogen, how the vacuole or vesicle containing the lysosome is going to attach to each other and how those enzymes are going to get released and that pathogen is destroyed and the waste is pushed out of the cell. This is the same phagocytosis that we've talked about over and over again. So if you need to pause and look at this in more detail, feel free to do so. <clears throat> All right, so here's a brief picture of how phagocytosis is going to occur. It, it occurs this way in nearly everything. Um, this is specific to a insect's innate immunity because here we have lysosomes, lysosome plural, lysozyme, lysosome singular, sorry, lysozyme plural. So the first thing that happens is you have to get the pathogen inside of the cell. So that's where the pseudopods this little structure here and this little structure here, they're going to make a vesicle surrounding the pathogen and engulf that pathogen through the process of endocytosis. Right. So for a long time, a lot of biologists didn't believe that insects had a true immune system the way we do. One of the ways they proved it, um, they used our, our type animal, or type, or model animal, sorry, in the form of fruit flies, Drosophila megalostar is the scientific name, what you guys call gnats, <laughs> and um, they cause them genetically to express GFP, green, green fluorescent protein, sorry guys, um, whenever their innate immune system was activated. So if nothing is trying to harm this fruit fly, it doesn't glow. But as soon as that innate response starts within the insect's body, it glows. And this was kind of proof that, okay, yeah, they do have an immune system. So another thing, they once they started delving deeper and they discovered the antimicrobial peptides, there was a lot of debate as to how important they were. Do, do, was they just one kind of antimicrobial peptide that kind of did all of the same functions? Did an insect really need multiple types? And, you know, there was this big debate. So, of course, being scientists, we tried to prove it. Um, what they did was they exposed fruit flies to a type of bacteria, and then also to a type of fungus. And if you look at the graphs, they have a wild-type fruit fly. is just a normal fruit fly that nothing's been done to. It's like one you find in nature, for example. And then they en engineered certain kinds of fruit flies. That would be the green line that my laser is on here. And these are what we call mutant flies. They're mutant because we've messed with their DNA. And we added just the presence of one of those antimicrobial peptides. So they took everything else away and added just that one antimicrobial um, peptide in the form of drosom ooh, drosomycin. Then they made another kind of mutant, that's the purple line, and 
added another kind of antimicrobial peptide, defenicin, and then there was the last mutant that had no kind of antimicrobial peptide whatsoever. So they subjected these four types of flies to, in this case, a fungus, and over time, look at what happened. The wild type, which is naturally going to produce all of these antimicrobial um, peptides, is still alive, is doing quite well, actually, very good survival rate. The mutant with the drosomycin is also doing fairly well, but look at the mutant with the defenicin and the mutant with no kind of antimicrobial peptide dying dismally right here. So this proves that at least in terms of a fungal, a fungal um, infection or attack, this type of antimicrobial protein is very important, whereas this type of antimicrobial protein doesn't really do anything for you. Then they took the same procedure four different types of fruit flies, some manipulated, some not manipulated, and this time they exposed them to a bacteria, and the opposite happened. Again, wild type is still surviving really, really well. Very good survival rate. Now look at the mutant with the defenicin. Again, they're also surviving really, really well. The mutant with just the drosomycin and the mutant with no antimicrobial peptides whatsoever, both doing dismally bad. So this proves that these antimicrobial peptides come in two forms. They provide immune response against different pathogens, one specifically for fungus and the other specifically for bacteria. All right, so again, didn't necessarily need to copy any of this down. You could. Um, this is just kind of reinforcement. Okay, so when we get to the innate immunity of vertebrates, it, it changes up a little bit. Um, the immune system of mammals is the best understood of all of the vertebrate species. And it compresses, or comprises, sorry, of a couple of different things, like barrier defenses, phagocytosis, antimicrobial peptides, just like in insects. But then we also have some additional defenses that you only find in vertebrates, things like specialized killer cells and interferons, which are special types of proteins, and the very classic inflammatory response. So we're gonna step through those. Okay, so the immune system of mammals is the ones that we understand the best of all the vertebrates, seeing as how humans are mammals. Um, so I always like to think of our lines of defense in terms of like a prison, <laughs> which I know sounds really bad, but it makes sense in my mind that way. So we have our first line of defense, which are barriers. Then our second line of defense is nonspecific control. Then our third line of defense is our actual immune system, our actual specific immunity. So your first line of defense, like I said, are barriers. So to me, that's like your walls and your barbed wire and your electrical fences. You have to be able to get in to, well, get out or get in to the prison to actually do some kind of damage. Um, if you do make it past the, the barriers, then we have nonspecific patrol. And if you think about it, it's like the the police officers or the prison guards, whatever we call them, who are stationed at like the, the, the gun towers, I don't know what it's called, and are just kind of patrolling the perimeter. They're not necessarily expecting to find a killer trying to like escape or someone trying to come in to bomb the prison or whatever, but they're there just in case. And if they do happen upon someone, then they'll take him out, or at least that's their job to take him out. Now, let's say you do manage to get over the wall you manage to escape the patrolman in the yard. Now you're actually going into the, um, the prison. And that's where everybody else is who will know where to find you. That's where we have cameras that can locate you, track you down, and either put you in jail or shoot you, whichever works out best. Same way your body works. I'll show you how. Let's step through it. <clears throat> okay, so your first line is what we call external defenses. If you think about it, your skin is a very good barrier. It's, a, it's pretty hard to get into your body because it's covered almost everywhere by this really connected epithelial tissue that we know as skin. Now, this is a nonspecific defense. The skin isn't trying specifically to keep out bacteria versus fungi versus splinters versus whatever else. It's just covering your body, which is one of its jobs. Now, even in the areas that 
we do have we don't have skin like for example our eyes and our nose because those are actual openings in our mouth we do have very specific epithelial cells that have either the ability to secrete mucus or they have little cilia which move things around so inside of our nose we have all these little nose hairs those hairs aren't there for decoration they're there to trap things that could potentially get in through your nose and do some damage we have eyelashes on our eyelids again same thing they're there to trap anything trying to come in that way okay um, we tend to find these epithelial cells and mucous membranes on our skin in our respiratory system in our digestive system and in our urogenital tract again think about it even if something goes in through like your windpipe, for example. If you cough, you're pushing that thing right back out. You know, sometimes you get dust in your eye and your eye starts to water. It's not, you're not crying. It's not that dust hurts you, but that's another defense. It's another line in your immune system. Those tears are washing out anything that could potentially get in through your eye. <clears throat> Okay, so still with the barriers, not all of them are physical. Some of the ones I just talked about actually are chemical, and they're found on epithelium. Epithelium is another name for epithelial cells. They're very, just very simple cells. Now, our skin and our mucous membranes secrete things like boogers. Those are the hardened versions. Snot, I guess, is the more runny version. That's just mucus as far as your body's concerned. And... It's there to trap microbes and potentially get rid of them. Think about it. When you blow your nose and you blow all that snot out, whatever is trapped in that snot gets blown out as well. We always think that we sweat just to help us cool down, but our sweat has a very specific pH, a pH anywhere between 3 and 5. Some bacteria can't withstand that. It helps to clear off anything on our skin. We talked about tears already. Again, that's a washing action. It's just flushing and pushing anything that could have gotten in through your eyes out of your system. Even saliva is antibacterial. Think of your dog. Have you ever seen your dog get hurt? Like they cut their paw or something and they're always licking it? It's because their saliva has antibacterial properties. Now, I'm not saying the next time you get cut to go like lick your wound or anything, but you know, it does have antibacterial properties. Then we have stomach acid. So even if you get in through our food, you're going in a very specific location in a very hostile environment. You probably are not going to survive there. And then we too have antimicrobial proteins in the form of lysozyme enzymes, which again are going to digest cell walls. Okay, our second line of defense is internal and it's broad range patrol. So these are the guys that are not necessarily looking for something specific, they're just kind of circulating, and if they find something, they'll get rid of it. So it's a general defense, it's very quick, but it doesn't retain any memory. It doesn't know who it fought and how to fight it again if it saw it. It's kind of like living in the moment. Oh, there's a bad guy in front of me, I'm going to take him out, and then I'm going to keep on my patrol. If I come upon another bad guy, I'll take him out again. But tomorrow, I'm not going to expect to find a bad guy and remember how I took out the first one. It doesn't retain any memory. So these are made up mostly of white blood cells, leukocytes, specifically phagocytic white blood cells. So these are the guys that can engulf things and destroy them that way. Um... They are going to attack and destroy pathogens that get and find their way inside. They're also part of what we call a complement system. Our complement system is made up of these antimicrobial proteins. Again, we'll step deeper into those later on. And then lastly, an inflammatory response, which again, we'll talk about. <clears throat> okay, so leukocytes are phagocytic white blood cells, and they are attracted by chemical signals released by damaged cells. So when cells get damaged, either physically damaged or something comes in and takes over them, they release chemical signals that's going to alert any leukocytes in the area that, hey, something's not quite right. So those leukocytes are going to start moving through your infected tissue, and they're going to try and engulf and ingest any microbes that they possibly can. Um... The most abundant form, the ones we have about 70% of them make up our immune system, would be neutrophils, and they live for about three days. 
Then we have macrophages, which are huge and live for a lot longer. And then we also have natural killer cells, which specifically destroy virus-infected cells and cancer cells. And the way they do that is by initiating apoptosis. So the complement system is made up of about 20 different proteins that all circulate in the plasma, the liquid portion of your blood. And it's their job to attack bacterial and fungal cells. Now, the main um, antimicrobial protein that we have is something called interferon. And interferon provides an innate defense. And like its name suggests, it interferes with viruses. And it also helps to activate macrophages. So it kind of disturbs the virus a little bit, so it kind of stops what it's doing. At the same time, it's signaling in this big macrophage that's going to come in and eat up the cell that contains the virus. They form a membrane attack complex. And what they do? They punch holes in the cell. They perforate the target cell, thereby causing apoptosis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So... This little visual, this is trying to give you a visual of how it works. This is going to be the cell membrane of whatever our target cell is, the cell that's been infected by a virus. We know it's been infected by a virus because it's going to present antigens on its surface. And when those cells rub together, remember cell-to-cell -cell recognition that we talked about in cell communication? They're going to notice, hey, this antigen isn't the one that this cell should be showing me. Something's weird here. So the interferon proteins are going to come in and start pushing their way through these phospholipids, thereby creating these spaces or these holes in the membrane. And that, that leads to apoptosis. Now I've thrown around the term inflammatory response several times already in this video. So here is where we talk about it. Whenever tissue gets damaged, it's going to trigger a local nonspecific inflammatory response. So when you inflame someone, you, you make them more agitated, you rile them up, you make their, them even more angrier than how they already were. And that's kind of what the inflammatory response does. It inflames the response of your immune system. So you're walking down the banister or wherever, the hallway, the stairs, whatever, and somehow you get a splinter in your hand. That splinter is going to do some damage to the soft tissue in your finger, in your hand, or wherever it is you picked up the splinter. The action of that splinter coming in and tearing off some of these tissues, or, you know, roughing up the tissue in this area, is going to start the inflammatory response. So two things are going to happen. We're going to release two types of molecules, histamines and prostaglandins. Histamines and prostaglandins are going to activate macrophages, and neutrophils. Both of these are types of white blood cells. These activated macrophils, macrophages sorry, and neutrophils are going to release another kind of molecule called cytokines. Cytokines are signal molecules, and it's their job to inflame the response. They're going to enhance your body's ability to respond to the splinter and whatever bacteria is on that splinter. So when those cytokines have been released, they're going to have the following effects. It's going to cause your capillaries, those little tiny blood vessels, to dilate. They're going to get bigger. They're going to move, be able to hold more blood. And that makes them more permeable because as they get bigger, the spaces between the cells open up. So this is going to increase blood supply. That means that white blood cells in your bloodstream and red blood cells and platelets and clotting factors are all going to the amount of them in that area is going to increase and this helps you to fight the pathogens because the white blood cells are going to come in and clean up all these bacteria and then all of the clotting factors and platelets are going to come in and close up this wound that we have right here so that nothing else can come in so we're going to have a clot or a scab being formed but because you're rushing so much more blood and cells into this generalized area, it's going to cause the area to swell. It is going to cause it to become red. It's going to increase the heat in that area. That's another way your body's going to try to kill off some of these pathogens. And that's known as the inflammatory response. All right, so again, 
this series of pictures just goes through everything that I just talked about. So here's the pathogen it's come in. The damage to the tissue and the presence of these pathogens are going to signal the um, production of histamines and prostaglandins, which in turn are going to activate macrophages and neutrophils. When those macrophages and neutrophils are activated, they're going to release a signal molecule of their own called cytokines, which is going to cause the dilation, look at how much bigger this is, of your capillaries. It's going to cause more white blood cells to flock to the area, killing off the bacteria in the area. And it's also going to increase the amount of blood that's going there, the amount of heat that's going there, so the area starts to swell and gets red and all of that. And then after you remove the splinter, the um, hole is going to get plugged up by platelets and clotting factors so that we no longer have a direct opening into our system. Okay, so when a local response is not enough, your body starts to go into what we call a systematic response. M macrophages have already been activated. They were activated when the first onslaught of the infection took place. Those macrophages are going to release a molecule called interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 is a signal molecule that is going to go, or is going to trigger, sorry, the hypothalamus of your brain. Now, hopefully you remember that the hypothalamus is your major nerve control, but it's also where your body's internal thermometer resides. So when interleukin-1 is released, the hypothalamus adjusts your body's temperature, raising it up from that 98 degrees Fahrenheit that we, we like so much. The higher temperature is actually to help you. I know it makes you feel crummy, but it's actually to help you. In the heat, bacteria can't grow and reproduce as quickly. It, stimula it stimulates sorry, um, phagocytosis, so a lot more white blood cells get activated. They're going to swamp to that area and try to eat up and engulf as many of those pathogens as they possibly can. It is going to speed up the repair of any tissues that might have been damaged, and it's going to cause your liver and your spleen to store iron, which is going to reduce your blood's iron levels. Now you may not know this, but one of the things that bacteria especially need in order to grow quickly is a large amount of iron. Seeing as how your red blood cells are full of iron, it makes it a perfect you know, place for bacteria to grow because there's a ready supply of what they need there. But if your liver and your spleen is storing more iron, then they don't have that iron readily available to you, or to them, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so you go through all of this, and you're still sick. Sometimes you're sick for weeks, and it's because even though your body does a fairly good job of defending you, some of these pathogens are still going to be able to avoid destruction, and the way they do that is they pretty much camouflage themselves. They modify their surface so that they don't present the antigens that say, hey, I shouldn't be here and then they are able to resist phagocytosis. So it's pretty much, if you blend in and look like you're supposed to be here, no one's gonna ask you any questions, and that's what these pathogens that avoid destruction do. A good example would be tuberculosis, and that's one of the reasons why, even with all our modern technology and medicine, tuberculosis still kills about a million people a year. And I specifically chose this picture because it's one of my favorites. Okay, this one's obvious. There's the guy right there. Right here, you have a flounder, which is a flat fish that kind of can change um, the appearance of its surface so that it blends in with its surroundings. And then right here, you have horn owls, which kind of blend in with their little tree bark thing, so it's hard to see them initially. Okay, third line of defense. So... We've gotten past the physical barrier, we've gotten past the chemical defenses and all of those cells. Now what? Well, now we bring out the big guns, the specific defenses, in the form of lymphocytes and antibodies. Now we have two kinds of lymphocytes, B lymphocytes or B cells and T lymphocytes or T cells. Antibodies belong to a family called immunoglobulins 
globulins. They're types of proteins. We just call them antibodies. It's easier. So the way I like to think of it is some of your lymphocytes are going to be... Okay, think of it this way. Your antibodies is kind of like the ammunition for your gun. Some of your lymphocytes are going to be in charge of making the ammunition. And other types of lymphocytes are going to be in charge of using the ammunition. What's their job? Their job is to respond to antigens, to specific pathogens, to specific um, toxins, and to any kind of abnormal body cells, cancer cells, that shouldn't be there. Okay, so how do we know the difference? Well, antigens, and I've been throwing that word around a lot too, are proteins that serve as name tags. They're presented or pushed out on the, the, um, the surface of the cell membrane so that when cells come into contact with each other, they know what cell it is. It's kind of like those hello, my name is tags that they give you when you go to conferences. <clears throat> now, if the antigen is foreign and it's not recognizable as something that your body has made, it is going to cause a response from your white blood cells. So anything that's a pathogen is going to have an antigen. That antigen is not going to look like any of the other antigens that your body cells have, and that's one of the ways that your white blood cells will be able to, to figure out that this particular cell, excuse me, should not be here. So B cells and T cells respond to these different antigens. B cells recognize intact antigens, so pathogens that are in the blood or in lymph whole antigens. T cells recognize ant antigen fragments. So after the pathogen has infected a cell, small parts of its cell membrane becomes the antigen, and those are going to be fragments. <clears throat> okay, pause if you need to. Okay, so let's look at those lymphocytes. So lymphocytes are made <clears throat> in two different places. The B lymphocytes are made in bone marrow, or they mature in bone marrow, and they're part of what we call our humoral response. Now, the word humoral comes from the word humors, which was an ancient word used to describe body fluids. Okay, so your, hum ugh, your humoral response deals with your body fluids, specifically your blood and your lymph. It is the job of your B cells to produce antibodies. T cells mature in the thymus, hence the T, and they're part of the cellular response system. They're the cells that are in charge of learning to distinguish self from non-self, okay? Sorry, hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. So here's something interesting. As T cells are going through their maturation, as they're developing, they have to learn how to distinguish self, or what's made by your body, from non-self, what's not made by your body. So your body is literally going to produce, or present, sorry, different antigens to them, self-antigens and non-self antigens. And if they react to self-antigens, then they're destroyed, because you don't want your body eating itself. All right, so let's look at those B cells again. Again, we said this is humoral response, which means that they're in fluid, and they're th your defense against attackers that are circulating within your blood or within your lymph fluid. Again, it's a specific response. The way they respond is they produce specific antibodies against a specific antigen. So it's not a general thing. If you are bacteria B, I am making antibody B to kill bacteria B. If you are bacteria C, I am making antibody C to kill bacteria C. It's, there's, it's very specific. One type of bullet for each different attacker. Okay, so there are two types of B cells. There are plasma cells, which are involved in antibody production and are part of that rapid response, but it's a short-term thing, so they're released quickly and they try to do their work quickly. Then we have memory cells, and memory cells are part of your long-term immunity. Pretty much what they do is they remember what these different pathogens are like, what their antigens look like, 
and what type of antibodies work against them so that if you ever meet them again, they can deal with them swiftly. So you know how sometimes they say, you know, if you get this, this particular disease, you can't get it again. It's not so much that you can't get it again, but it's just that your body retains such a good memory of it that it fights it almost immediately. And before you even realize you're sick, your body's already taken care of it. Okay, antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that bind to a specific antigen. They are multi-chain proteins. They're made by B cells, and they have what we call a binding region. Their binding region, you can kind of think of it like an active site. So it's going to match the molecular shape of the different antigen that it can bind to. Just like enzymes, they are unique and they are specific. So your body literally makes millions and millions of antibodies so that it can respond to millions of different types of antigen. The way they work is they kind and I know I called them ammunition earlier, but they kind of work like handcuffs. So when the B cells shoot them out, they attach themselves to whatever the foreign cell is and they hold on to that cell so the cell can't get away. Right, so this is what they look like in terms of structure. We always draw them like a Y because they're kind of Y-shaped. Right, and this right here would be where it could bind to an antigen, and here is where it can bind to an antigen as well. Okay, so antibodies work by inactivating antigens, and there are a couple of ways that it can happen. One of the ways is called neutralization, and neutralization just means that the antibody it <clears throat> coats the bacteria, it completely like takes over the bacteria so that nothing else can bind to it, like here and here. Then there's agglutination, where one or two antibodies might bind to individual bacterial cells, and then they'll all clump together, like this. Then there's precipitation of soluble antigens, where they bind to the antigen, multiples of them will bind to the antigen, and then again they all clump together, so they precipitate out. And then we have what we call complement fixation, or activation of that complement system, like I said before. So when the antibody binds, it signals those interferon molecules to come in and form spaces in the cell membrane, leading to the lysis of the cell. These other three all lead to phagocytosis. So pretty much it's like you're creating this gigantic target for the white blood cell, the phago, the macrophage, sorry, to come in and engulf. Okay, so what happens if this pathogen still gets past these B cells and it still gets to one of my cells and it attacks my cell and infects it? Well, that's where I call in the really big guns, also known as my assassin cells, my killer T cells. And the, the term killer isn't light, are killing things. Okay, so T cells are part of what we call cell-mediated response, and it's the immune response to cells that have already been inf infected by some kind of virus or parasite or bacteria or whatever pathogen. And it's defense against non-self cells. So cancer or transplant cells, all of those can fit into this cell-mediated response. There are two types of T cells, helper T cells and cytotoxic or killer T cells. Now you should be really familiar with helper T cells from the whole HIV thing. Helper T cells are highly important, which is why when the AIDS virus attacks them, it causes such an issue. Helper T cells alerts your immune system. That's their job. They're kind of like your mega horn or your snitch, whatever you want to call it. Whereas your cytotoxic T cells are going to attack and destroy body cells that have already been infected. So, how does it work? Well, remember I told you that cells get tagged, right? With those, those antigens, like they're like the hello my name is tags. And it's done by something called a major histocompatibility, or MHC, protein. MHC proteins, hold on a second, okay, sorry about that. So MHC proteins are charged with constantly moving 
cellular material from the cytosol to the cell surface. It's almost like they're presenting a snapshot of what's going on inside of the cell. It is this MHC protein that gives the cell it, its, um, its antigen or its name, its name tag. So as proteins get made or whatever it is it gets made, these little purple spots right here, those represent the MHC proteins. Those MHC proteins are just going to take up some different samples of what's in the cell currently and bring it to the surface of the cell membrane and push it out or present it. So T cells are going to come in and they're going to do cell to cell recognition. They're going to roll over that cell and the antigen will tell the T cell if there is a need to activate or not to activate. So how do T cells know when a cell is infected? Infected cells digest pathogens and MHC proteins are going to bind these pathogens or pieces of these pathogens, sorry, and carry them to the cell surface. So, so once that virus or that pathogen or that bacteria, whatever, gets into the cell, it's going to start creating proteins, little bits and pieces of itself might be floating around inside the cytosol. So the MHC proteins are going to pick up those pieces and transport them to the cell surface and present them. Okay, when they do that and it's an actual antigen, the name changes. These cells now become what we call antigen presenting cells or APCs. It's the antigen presenting cells that alert helper T cells that something's wrong because as soon as they start putting these antigens, these foreign antigens on their surface, and these helper T cells come in and kind of realize, wait a minute, this isn't made by my body, it signals or it triggers the signaling of the cytotoxic T cells. All right, so T cell response works this way. We have this infected cell. It's had bits and pieces of a pathogen on its inside. So the MHC proteins have brought those pieces up to the surface and are presenting those antigens. So now it's an APC or antigen presenting cell. A helper T cell is going to realize that, wait a minute, these antigens are foreign, something weird is going on, and they're going to start signaling for cytotoxic T cells. Another way this could happen is if macrophages have already engulfed cells that had a pathogen on its inside, now those bits and pieces are inside of that macrophage, and that macrophage will present those antigens to those helper T cells as well. Either way, the antigen is telling the helper T cell that something's wrong. Okay, This is not a self-cell. So interleukin-1, which these activated macrophages release, is going to call in more helper T cells, and more helper T cells are going to notice that, hey, this cell's infected, something screwy is going on. Okay, so pretty much there are just two ways that helper T cells can be um, activated or called in. So the helper T cells are going to do two things. Well, really one thing. They're going to start making interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 is going to do two different things. It is going to stimulate or activate cytotoxic T cells, and it's also going to stimulate B cells and antibodies. And that's how T cell response takes place. Okay, so how exactly do these cytotoxic cells kill? Well, they bind to the target, and they secrete a protein called preferin, and preferin punctures the cell membrane of the infected cell, causing it to lyse. So like right here, it binds to the cell, it secretes its preferin um, protein, and the preferin just destroys the cell. It punches holes in the cell just like interferon does. All right. All right, so in this diagram, we're just showing how... Um, the antigen can get inside of a cell. So here is the pathogen, goes in. Now fragments of that antigen are all inside of the cell. 
those MATs are going to present them. A T cell is going to do some cell to cell recognition and realize that something is wrong. And then it's going to start the process of contacting cytotoxic T cells and getting those cells destroyed. Okay, so plant immune response. So do plants have an immune system? You bet they do. Um, plant immune response is going to take place in two major ways. The first is going to be some kind of mechanical defense. So I have really sharp thorns like this acacia tree or like whatever this plant is that if you try to eat me, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to make you pay. You're going to be in a lot of pain and you're going to realize, yeah, it's really not worth it. I'm not even bothering with this plant anymore. Or I might secrete some kind of toxin like poison ivy, for example, that's going to make you either really, really sick or it's going to kill you. Either way, you're going to get the message that eating me isn't a very good idea. Now, if my mechanical defenses don't work, then I can also have chemical defenses that I will put forth and use as my form of immune response if I am a plant. Another thing that I can do is I can bring in reinforcements. I can call in my backup team, my SWAT team, whatever. I'll show you what I mean in this. Okay, so like I said, plant immune response is more systematic. So it's a bunch of chemical signals, really, that travel throughout the plant. And it's all about pattern recognition and recognizing different microbial signatures. So those, whatever's trying to kill me or eat me or whatever, is going to leave behind traces of itself, which is going to act as a trigger, which is going to allow me to send out my chemical defense. Now, once the signals go out, the plant is going to produce what we call a localized hypersensitive response, or an HR. The result is going to be rapid apoptosis at the location, which is going to prevent the infection from spreading. So let's say it was like a nematode or some kind of plant bacteria that's infected this plant and it's now spreading from plant cell to plant cell. Well, instead of risking the entire plant, the plant is going to kill just the cells infected. But the rest of the plant is fairly healthy. Okay, plants can also have a defensive response, which is called systematic acquired resistance, or SAR. And what that does is it renders the entire plant resistant to what we call broad spectrum infectious agents. Pretty much it's a lot of chemical messengers in the form of salicylic acid and jasmonic acid, just to give you a few names. And it's going to result in some signal cells producing defensive compounds to protect on an yeah, sorry, uninfected parts. So we might start pumping some poisons or some toxins into our leaves and trying to get rid of whatever's trying to eat us or make us sick that way. Or we can send out pheromones that will cause, um, sorry, for some reason, every time I make a video for you guys, my allergies start to like bug me. Anyway, yeah, so we can send out pheromones. They're going to cause maybe insects that live on that particular plant to respond, like in the acacia and some other things. Okay, so hopefully this was fairly clear and it wasn't too, too confusing. Um, if you have any questions, I'll see you on Monday and on Tuesday. Bye, guys.